The first time I heard Carter Sampson sing, it felt a little like coming home. Her voice, like Patty Griffin, like Amy Lou, had a songwriter's vulnerability to it. Intelligent and witty with enough sadness mixed in to feel honest. She has just enough hint of a twang for me to feel like we should talk about John Prine of a black coffee and enough warmth for me to let down my guard and exchange the coffee for a beer. Carter's been playing professionally for about five years, all over the US and around the globe taking her folk country sensibilities and awesome cowboy boots to audiences everywhere. And when I met her, I felt like I already knew her, which is one of those magical kind of secrets reserved for prophets and singer-songwriters. Listen to her sing, and you'll feel like she was telling your story from the stage. I started singing from a very young age, and then when I was in middle school, going into the eighth grade, I um, auditioned for the choir, and I didn't make the cut. It wasn't good enough. And... Um, so that's when I decided to start playing guitar because I didn't want anyone to be able to tell me if I was good enough to do something or not. So that was 15 years old when I started playing guitar and played shows, you know, would play in the school talent show and here at coffee shops here and there and then open mics for years in my early 20s and then just started playing as much as I possibly could. Any place I could play and, and now I play, you know, over 200 shows a year. Okay, and then you, you actually moved out of state for a little bit. You lived in Arkansas yeah, for a short period. Yeah, a couple period. of times. Um, you know, I feel like I spent the first 18 years of my life trying to figure out how to get out of Oklahoma. And I did. I moved to Boston. Um, and that was actually a really good starting place for music, too. I played music in the subways there. when I kind of, for, you know, I'd been playing for a few years, but I didn't know that many songs. And it was great because I could play the same three songs over and over again. There was always a new crowd <laughs> you know, every 15 minutes. Um, so I lived in Boston for about a year and then um, moved back and I think that really made me realize that Oklahoma is a pretty great place to be and that it's it's where I belong, it's where my roots are. And a few years later I moved to Fayetteville, Arkansas for a few years and uh, and that was that was great. And I wrote Queen of Oklahoma there because I missed Oklahoma so much. So mm -hmm. um, I think I was there for two years and then uh, came back and bought an RV and been based out of Oklahoma ever since. Well, Queen of Oklahoma is like one of my favorite Thanks. songs of yours, and it's one of the songs that, like, whenever you've, you've got the band behind you, it's upbeat and it's like an it's almost anthemic. Yeah. Like, you, it makes it makes me pumped, and I'm I'm not a Queen of Oklahoma. <laughs> you could be. <laughs> I'm you working can be on it. Anything you want. Thank you. Um, but then whenever I listen to you, even like sort of acoustically by yourself, there's almost like a sadness to it as well. Oklahoma's 
a pretty interesting place to live. Lots of uh, uh, beautiful people, lots of hard times. Sure. Uh, tell me a little bit about your relationship with Oklahoma in regards to as an artist and your music. Yeah, you know, that, that song in general, I, like I said, I really did sit down when I was living in Arkansas to write a song about Oklahoma and the things that I loved and missed about it. And I wrote half a song and then it just kind of hit me all of a sudden that it would be much better of a place at least for me <laughs> if we had royalty and I was the queen of it so in some ways it's like this kind of sick peek into my <laughs> my dream world um, and then it kind of it kind of developed and became something else especially once I moved back to Oklahoma like I said I, th I think that I appreciate it much more as an adult than I did as a kid I remember flying into the Oklahoma City Airport as a teenager, and I don't know if you remember, they had Reba McIntyre on the loudspeaker, and she was like, hey, y'all, welcome to Oklahoma. <laughs> it was just like the cheesiest, hokiest thing ever. No, I don't remember that. And I hated it. I remember like going to, to Europe as a teenager and coming home and being like, oh my God, I'm back in this place, and I hate it so much. And now I think like I would probably break down into tears if I came back and heard Reba McIntyre on the, mm. <laughs> the loudspeaker at the airport. And there is something about um, growing up, too, and realizing that you know, your, your roots are where they are and you don't really have much control over it. If I was the queen of Oklahoma Well, tell me, like, a little bit about the, the, the genre of music that you play. How would you describe the music? It's a tricky one. You know, I feel like in the last few years, this Americana term has kind of blown up, and um, I think it's a really good umbrella term for um, for all styles of music, but but authentic, true music. And I, I hope that that's where I would fall. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little. My songs are a little folky, and sometimes. Um, they're country, they're getting to be more and more country the older I get. That's another thing I think I'm realizing that all that 90s country music that I loathed as a teenager, now I love and I listen to it constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love my, I'm working on a new record now, but the next one <clears throat> I would love to do just a straight honky tonk record and kind of somewhere in between Patsy Cline and like Kitty Wells with the orchestra and mm -hmm. all that cool stuff. Um, I love all kinds of music. I also have a dream to be in a very loud all girl punk band and and do that as well so we'll see <laughs> someday that's cool and like you know my same songs that are, are folky when i'm playing them solo can very much be more rock and roll when i have the band with me so. And 2003, and I was 13. <laughs> Are you serious? No. <laughs> I was 20. Well, didn't 23? You were playing when you were younger, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, Greg was being sarcastic when he said 13, but it's been a while. It's yeah. A long time. I know. It's crazy all the people that have passed on too. So you just, uh, you're finishing up with an album? Yeah, we recorded it. Um, my friend Jason Scott has a small one room studio in, in his backyard and more, and we recorded it all there, and I'm really, really happy with the way it's sounding. That's exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. it is, it is, sure. What's the title? Lucky. We talked before about um, kind of another passion project of yours. Yeah. Uh, tell me about it. Yeah, I'm the founder and director of the Rock and Roll Camp for Girls here in Oklahoma City. We're a nonprofit organization, volunteer run, um, all female volunteers the week of camp. We have a lot of male allies that really help us out behind the scenes. But um, part of why we want to have uh, the female volunteers is to, to be role models in the sense that girls sometimes just need to see a woman play the drums or they need to see a woman run sound or something that... Something that maybe they're passionate about, but they've never seen anyone that looks like them do it. Right. Um, so it's important for us to, to give them that. The basic idea is that girls walk in the first day and don't know what instrument they're going to be given. So they walk in and we say, congratulations, you're a drummer or you're a bass player. And in the morning, they take instrument classes from um, local female musicians. And then in the afternoon, they form bands. They do band practice every afternoon and write a song together, which they perform at a big showcase uh, after camp is over on Saturday. 
we try to create a safe space for these girls to be exactly who they are and 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 get them all to accept differences because I think that's what makes us our human race is beautiful. If we were all the same person, it would be really boring. Same as if we all liked the same band or all music sounded the same. Um, so we really encourage the girls to get to be their weird little selves. And it's it's really awesome to see them blossom in one week, come in really shy and quiet. And then by the end of it, they're nutty <laughs> in a good way. Not a fuss about your gray anymore. Thank God. So you mentioned um, in regards to your songwriting and your songs, sort of this uh, pursuit of authenticity, yeah. kind of being authentic. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Writing the truth, writing from the perspective of something that you've actually gone through or, or witnessed. I'm not to say that you can't tell someone else's story. That and then, you know, actually playing and singing the music. It's, you know, we have all this technology now that allows for any, literally anyone to go into a recording studio and make something that sounds decent, at least, you know, mm -hmm. auto-tune, and you can do that to instruments and, and synthesize instruments. And I think that that's happened a lot over the last, you know, 10 or so years, especially in Nashville, and you, you just get this sound to me that it's just, it's not a true sound. It's not, it's not believable mm -hmm. to me. But there definitely is a place to, I feel like to bring back some of that authentic music that has been lost over the last 10 or 15 years. And why is that important? I feel like being yourself is, is the best thing you can do for yourself. You know, allowing yourself to be who you truly are. Um, and I want that to come through with my music. Legacy is not so much about what you brought to the table as it is about what you leave behind when you're gone from it. What you did with the short time you had, the moment you were given and the moment you took. The truth is that Carter Sampson is leaving a legacy from the stage and the spotlight and with her work to empower the generation of fierce girls who will follow in her snakeskin boot footsteps. The audience will believe her because what she is singing is honest and it gets in your bones. And those little girls will know what they can do because she is up there doing it. Stephen King wrote, that's the worst I think when the secret stays locked within, not for one of a teller, but for one of an understanding ear. And the artist, the singer, the filmmaker, the storyteller, whether around a campfire, on a screen, or on a stage, they, they need an audience. The magic has to be seen, the song has to be heard, that's the contract, and that's how you start to build that legacy. Carter, your stage awaits, lady. Men and women, boys and girls, needing authenticity and truth and the strength to be their own weird selves. The world is listening. Well, I like the city, but not as much as Tulsa.